Welcome to the premier launch of I Love My Tools, the radio show. This is Mike DeZino, your host, also known as America's Blind Tradesman. And tonight is a double celebration because, yes, it's our first show, but you know what the bigger celebration is? You, the American worker. That's who we're here to celebrate, the American tradespeople out there, the people that make it happen, you know, the ones who built America, the ones who keep it running. All those people out there with their skill and their dedication and all their hard work, that's who we're here celebrating tonight. Each week, we are going to, along with our guests and our listeners, we're going to delve into the world of the trades, and we will discuss things like the ups and downs of the economics of uh, having a trade for a career, the fundamentals that we have learned in the trades that have stood the test of time, and of course, that means sometimes to the new things, to the new materials and the new procedures that we have learned recently. There's a lot of great stuff out there now. And, of course, we will be sharing stories of the fun side of the trade, the culture of the trades, of the fun and the serious side of the people that have lives in the trades and put in a 40, 50-year working career. To get things going here, uh, I would like to tell a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from and some of my personal thoughts of how I feel about the trades. Because the trades, I really believe, are the great equalizer in our society. Of all the jobs that are out there, the trades are the one that put us all on equal footing. If you got the skill, you've got the job, and it's that simple. I was born blind, and I was the first blind child in the United States that was allowed to have a public school education. So they didn't teach Braille, so I didn't learn Braille in public schools. My parents were ordinary working people. My dad was a television and radio repair man and a handyman all around, could uh, do some pretty good carpentry and pretty good auto mechanics work and welding and stuff. He was an all-around handy guy. And in the early days of television, there was a lot more than being just a tube jockey and pulling tubes in and out and stuff. You had to build a lot of things in those days just to deliver televisions. My mom worked in a factory and in a buffering room, and also worked as a waitress in later years, and also uh, ran a stamping machine making lipstick tube holders. And the fortunate thing was I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, which in its day, it was full of many industries. It was a huge industrial center in the Northeast. During World War II, it was considered a priority one target by the Nazis to bomb it because anything made of brass or copper Anything, anything from belt buckles to shell casings to clock gears to plumbing fixtures, anything made of brass or copper, no matter where you found it in the world, at some point it passed through my hometown, Waterbury, Connecticut. And because of the industries, there were lots and lots of tradespeople all around me, and that gave me the opportunity to see the trades for what they were. As young as five years old, I worked for my father in his television store uh, on a drill press drilling angle iron because in those days you had to make your own mounts and everything for television antennas to put them up on the roof. Uh, for you younger folks, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Yeah, there was a time you actually sometimes would put up uh, to get out of the valley. Sometimes some of the homes had uh, 50, 60, 100 foot tall antennas on top of the roof, big towers and everything else. It was pretty amazing. It was a great start for me with tools in my hands, but my father ran his life off the rails with alcohol. And when I was 11 years old, he abandoned my mother and my brother and I and left us to fend for ourselves. And that left me the man of the house in those days. And that meant I had to learn how to fix things because I took it very seriously. I was the man of the house. And when we ran out of oil, uh, I had to go get the five-gallon can of range fuel and bring it in and know how to bleed a furnace at 11, 12 years old and get the heat going again before my mother got home at 11 o'clock at night from her second job. Didn't want her coming home to a cold house and began to make a little side money repairing things for the neighbors and stuff, doing everything from shining shoes to fixing their lawnmower or doing little small repairs on electrical cords and things. And as time went on, I began to do more and more in the trades. And even though I went to college, I was a physics major, it's the trades that paid me the most money in my life. And that's what I found amazing about the trades. Actually, some statistics about the trades, because we have a big debate going on in this country right now about college and all the debt the college kids go into. Well, 
first of all, only about 25% of our young adults go to college, and half of them never graduate, by the way. That's pretty sad when you consider that the sum total of college debt two years ago at over a trillion dollars surpassed the sum total of all credit card debt in the United States. Think about that. When credit card debt could be anybody from 18 years old up to 100 years old who has a credit card, that little slice of the 18 to 26, 28-year-old in college debt is a greater number than everybody with credit card debt. I mean, that's mind-boggling. But the actual fact is that the average person going into the trades at age 18, and according to the actuarial tables and Social Security, now you'll work 50 years because you can't retire until you're 68 currently. In those 50 years, the majority of the people going into the trades will earn more money than most people who go to college. Actual fact pretty amazing when you think about that. Mike Rowe, the host of the television show America's Dirtiest Jobs, I saw him in a TV interview a few months ago, and it was very interesting what he said. He had mentioned something that he never got to say on that show. All those dirty, disgusting jobs, everybody except two of the people that he filmed and interviewed for all those disgusting jobs, only two people out of all those people were not multimillionaires. The trades have been a path for equal opportunity, and the trades have been a path for financial empowerment, multi-generational financial stability in families since the days of the immigrant waves when great-grandpa came to the United States back in the 1800s, and he had a trade. And even though he looked funny and talked funny and dressed and wore funny clothes and ate funny food, all the prejudices in the world didn't add up to the fact they needed him. And when they needed him, they had to employ him because they needed his hands. They needed his mind. They needed his effort. That's what, And it was with the great wave of the Irish immigrants who built all the roads and uh, up in the uh, northeast and city sewer lines and all that, water supplies and drainage ditches and everything. And the Italian immigrants who came and did all the stonework and the German immigrants who came and lent their expertise. And it was always a great starting point in the trades. And to this day, you know what? It's still the great starting point. Right now, there's all kinds of great statistics out there. The average welder in the United States right now makes about $105,000 a year. Right here in the South, there are car factories. That if you can graduate high school with a diploma and you can pass a basic urine drug test, they will start you out at $14 an hour teaching you how to weld with the promise that in two years they'll push you to $18 an hour. And if you show any leadership ability, you'll find yourself at uh, above $20 an hour, $22 an hour very quickly after that. And here in the South, when you're living in one of the economically depressed states, somebody who makes that kind of money is living in the upper end of the middle class range of incomes down here. What's great, too, about it, your trade is portable. Your skill can go with you. You know, Donald Trump, he's a billionaire. Well, you know, that only works for him because he's got those buildings. He can't move those buildings. And if all of a sudden New York City is not the cool place to be someday or something happens, you know, uh, those folks who say the world is melting and the seas rise and those golf courses along those uh, oceanfront properties get buried under uh, seawater, you can't take those away. You know, you're stuck to that. You're married to that land. But your trade, grab your toolbox. Head west, young man. Head south. Go where the jobs are. It's a pretty interesting uh, lifestyle when you're in the trades. And there's a lot of other side benefits, too, because it's not just the money you make. It's the money you save. There's a certain level of proficiency, self-reliance, independence that comes when you have some basic trade skills. I know because, uh, because in my own life, I had the pleasure of working in 13 different trades in my work career, and I absolutely love the trades. And we'll talk more about that because there's a lot of opportunity in the trades also. Um, you know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to play a song right now. I think you need to hear from Miss Dolly Parton right now. I think that would be a good thing. After that, I'll tell you why I play her song. You are listening to I Love My Tools, the radio show with your host, Mike DiZino, America's blind tradesman. And now, back to the show. 
Thank you, Miss Dolly. Thank you for the nine to five. Now you're going to hold it now. That's nine to five. Well, you know what? These people who work in offices are going to type a hundred words a minute. That's a skill too, you know. Skill sometimes doesn't mean with jackhammers and bulldozers, you know, there's other skills you can have. But the reason I play Dolly Parton is because other than the fact that I like her, I think she's cool. Uh, she and her husband have been married about 40 years and Miss Dolly Parton's husband is a paving contractor. I'll tell you. Now, there's a reason to go into the trades. If you could end up with a great significant other like Dolly Parton, a gal who's got her own career and does just fine by herself and stands by her man. There's a reason right there. I know a lot of in the 60s and 70s, a lot of us bought electric guitars and got in bands so we could meet women. Well, maybe you could go into the trades, too. And you gals, hey, let's leave you out. Over the years in the companies I've built, I had lady carpenters and painters and wallpapers and stuff working for me. Uh, I even had a lady uh, roofer in one of the companies, and this goes back 40 years ago. So uh, we were a little bit ahead of our time, right? But yeah, Dolly is a solid lady, and her husband, like I say, is a paving contractor. So that's kind of a cool thing. On the subject of um, the trades and why they're so important to us, you know, there isn't anything in the United States that we have that somebody didn't build first. (laughs) So the, the kind of the rule of thumb is if nobody built it, it doesn't exist. And if nobody keeps it running, then it's of no use to anybody. So the trades are a very important part to the economic fabric of the United States that creates the behemoth uh, economic engine that we all refer to as the great American dream. That's an important part. And this is why during this election year, not to get political or anything else, but candidates that want to talk about bringing jobs back to this country, you know, the construction jobs and the jobs in the trades, electrical, plumbing, welding, turning a wrench, being an auto mechanic, being a roofer, uh, a bricklayer, whatever, whatever your trade is, your job never was sent to China, was it? You can't send a leaking roof to China. You can't send a wall that needs to be painted to China. You know, you can't send, uh, you know, a car that needs a tune-up to China just to get a tune-up. Those jobs never left the country. The jobs that left the country uh, were uh, a lot of the manufacturing jobs, and it's you know, uh, because they were labor intensive and unfortunately they were able to be shipped out because the machinery could be shipped out because the work could be shipped out to follow the machinery. Uh, Whereas in the trades, most of your jobs are very secure against that. I know from my own experience, the trades have been very good to me economically. And that's pretty amazing when you consider I am a member of the blind community, which typically even during good times has a 75% unemployment rate, which far exceeds any other demographic in the greater American society. We have a support website called I Love My Tools, with an S, I Love My Tools.com, and it is a pretty interesting site because you get to meet me over there, and I'll show you some of the tricks that I've learned over the years that makes it possible for a blind guy to uh, build and work in the trades and And yes, I still have all 10 fingers. Yes, I do. Uh, Praise the Lord for that one. I usually tease my friends and say it's a good thing I started out with 12. And by the time I got down to 10, I figured out what wasn't working. But uh, no, seriously, we've got a lot of great stuff over there. You can learn a few things. We've got some great stuff that we're putting up over there. And for this show and for the ilovemytools.com website, we have some ways that you can communicate with us. And one is questions at ilovemytools.com, questions at ilovemytools.com. If you have any questions or you have a topic that you'd like us to address, we'll gladly do that. And the other one is comments, because your comments mean something. As long as you're kind and you're not mean-spirited, I don't want to hear that you think it's ridiculous, I'm in the trades, and you want me to go back to selling pencils on a street corner with other blind people like the stereotype is supposed to be. So we don't want to hear those kinds of things. But comments at ilovemytools.com. So questions or comments at ilovemytools.com, and we'd be glad to accommodate your uh, what you'd like to know. The other thing is that I wanted to share with you is we are working on some fun apps that we're working on. And it's called, Are You Smarter Than a Blind Tradesman? And it's a series of quizzes in different trades and things that I've worked in over the years. And they're basic questions. There's 10 questions each quiz, and you score yourself. 
And what's really cool about them is um, you get a score, and your score tells you where you kind of stand against other people in the world, both in and out of the trades, because we are also not talking just to people in the trades. We're talking to people who might even just be considering if a career in the trades might be their ticket to the great American dream. So you might uh, try a couple of the different categories of quizzes in plumbing, electrical, general repairs, carpentry, automotive, and just kind of see where you'd fit in, see where your uh, skill sets lie. It's kind of cool, and they're fun. By the way, tonight helping me is uh, Dave Miola, who himself is a tradesperson also, who's our producer here tonight. Dave, you want to say hello to the folks? Hello, folks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, Dave was, a, um, among many things, was actually a truck driver and was actually a tractor-trailer instructor and certified and a million other things he's done, jack of all trades, as, as many of us are in the trades. You know, uh, you buy a tool and you learn how to use it, so it's kind of fun. And some of the people coming on the show uh, will be friends of mine that work with me in the trades as time goes on here. And by the way, we have live chat if you go to AmericanPatriotRadio.com. We have live chat rooms going on while we're on the air like this, so you can participate in the chat room with your thoughts and comments if you're shy and don't want to come on the phone. And if you'd like to join us and actually speak up, that's easy to do. Uh, you just simply uh, dial the uh, number that's at the AmericanPatriotRadio.com website, and you can get in and join us. Apprenticeships. That's another thing the trades are great for. We have a great system of teaching that has just totally broken down in our society evidence the kids today uh the young folks today don't know how to do much of anything uh yeah they can play with the apps and yeah they can mess with their little phones and they can set the time on your microwave and all that but i'll tell you they're not much for being able to keep their cars running and uh and doing that kind of work or basic repairs around the house or anything else and it's sad in a way because that's a form of living an apprenticeship and what's sad about that is i was um listening to, uh, oh, what the heck's his name? He was on the TV show Cheers. He played coach. He was talking one time in an interview, and he pointed out something, and when I did the research, I found out, darn, if he wasn't right. We are the first generation in human history that has failed to teach our children to use tools. For thousands of years of human history, going back to ancient times when we were needing to know how to hunt with a spear and make fire with two rocks. We are not teaching our children how to use the basic tools that our society is built with. That's a very sad commentary on our society. That is, in a way, really tragic because 15 years ago, I was on an air flight. I was uh, working as a corporate trainer teaching um, self-employment uh, to people around the country that wanted to... Uh, pursue a career in the trades, and we'll talk about that tonight, as being self-employed. I happened to sit next to a gentleman who worked for uh, Nucor Steel Corporation. And we got on the subject of the steel industry in the United States. And what he said was the saddest part was it wasn't that so much steel wasn't being made in the United States anymore, being made in the United States. That wasn't the sad part. What the sad part was that the... Um, the tool makers, the people who knew how to take that steel and make the tools and make the machinery to tool that steel and to work with it, they were a dying breed because there were no more people going into that trades. And he said, if we had to, we could ramp up making steel. We can get blast furnaces going online pretty quickly. But he said the rest we couldn't do. Where are the skilled people coming from that could work those trades? Because the apprenticeship programs weren't there anymore. When I grew up as a kid, all the factories in our town, you know, after high school, you went to work for Pratt & Whitney or Sikorsky or uh, True Love McLean or Scoville or uh, uh, Anaconda or uh, French Metal Tubing or Chase American Brass or any of these huge companies. And you went to work there. And uh, in the summer, between your years in high school, you could go to work. Or when you came back from the service, you could get a job at these places because they were booming. Uh, Electric Boat was another one where they built all the nuclear submarines. And it was really interesting because there was an apprenticeship program. You came in a certain level. Now, for the first week or two, you might have walked around with a rag just wiping oil off of machinery and told to keep your eyes open and your hands out of the gears. But in time, they'd say, okay, I want you to do this. I want you to do it here. Pay attention here. 
Here's how you take this apart. Here's how you get that emergency cover off to fix that chain or whatever. And little by little, over a three or four or five year period, you learn that trade so that you were a tool maker. And it was a great program. And we just don't seem to have those kinds of things now. And now a lot of states are starting or to mandate that uh, the kids have the ability to learn a trade, too, because college is just not for everybody. Uh, the same as the trades might not be for everybody. But you got to you got to give young folks that opportunity to figure out where their talents are, what where their passion is. You know, lots of them say, well, the kids today don't want to do anything. Well, do anything what? You know, what have you shown them? What experience have they had? Most of them won't even change a wheel on a bicycle. Their their attitude is when they have a flat tire, mom is supposed to run to the store with a charge card and buy a new bicycle. They don't understand that that wheel comes off and that there's an inner tube in there that can be patched. When they look at a vehicle, like their own vehicle, they look at it as an entire item. They don't open the hood. They don't see a water pump and a, and a fuel injector and... Uh, and uh, a power steering pump and all that, a master cylinder for the brakes. They don't see that. They just look under the hood and see all that stuff in there as one big conglomerate. They don't see it as parts. They don't see the bolts. They don't understand that every part in there was put on by somebody's hands, and every part in there can come off and be replaced by somebody's hands. And a lot of it is just our our failure to involve our children, the young folks, in the practices of what we do in the various trades, get them involved. And I know we live in a very hectic society. And yes, I know when you got your lawn tractor out and you were doing an oil change on it, it's probably a royal pain in the butt to let your 12 year old unscrew the oil filter and turn a few bolts on it and all that, because you could do it yourself in, in you know, one tenth the time. But it's important that you hand them the oil filter wrench and say, here, take that off. Let me show you how it's done. Because, first of all, there's a tremendous sense of accomplishment. And a lot of the issues that we see with children today, uh, some of the things that are in the news about what goes on on college campuses and uh, their lack of uh, uh, fortitude, let's just say that way, emotional fortitude, comes from low self-esteem. And low self-esteem comes from having done nothing to have self-esteem. And it's really important to you hand him a wrench or you hand him a hammer, or you hand him a dozen nails and say, here, finish nailing this off. I'm telling you, they're proud in that. You, you, they, you won't see it, but every chance they get, they're going to go sneak around the corner and take a look at that railing or that step they nailed down and fixed and everything else. It's a matter of pride. And it's really important to have those little victories when you're young because it's what builds the foundation that, you know, we're delaying success with our children until they're, what, 35, 40 years old, when maybe after college they land a high paying job and they might move up some corporate ladder somewhere. Uh, well, that doesn't happen for most of them. So they live a life of never really knowing where they fit in and what they're capable of doing. So this is a real important subject. This is a real hot subject with me because I have a very simple concept. I don't believe in throw away people. And we can talk more about that here in a minute. Let's just take a break here and I'll rest my voice and we'll uh, let's hear from a mighty big man who was important to a whole bunch of people one day. And we'll hear about him right now. Hey, you are listening to an episode of I Love My Tools, the radio show with your host, Mike DiZeno, America's blind tradesman. And now let's get right back to the show. Okay. Just before the song there, Big John, a man who made a difference to all those other miners. That's another thing, too. When you work in the trades, you work as a team many times, and it's fun. You'll make friendships, and you will uh, uh, have people that will become lifelong friends, and you'll find yourself one day talking to the grandchildren, and you'll find yourself talking about, yeah, we've known each other 30, 40, 50 years, and uh, it's pretty amazing in the trades. But uh, I had made the comment that I don't believe in throwaway people. This is a topic that I can get away with talking about in public because I don't have to be PC on the subject of the disabled since I am a member of that community. There are very few, few, few disabilities that are so debilitating that a person can contribute absolutely nothing to their household or to their uh, 
community or to their town or to their children's school or to their neighborhood. And I get very concerned when, for example, a few years ago, because of the downturn in the economy, our government decided that uh, two years of unemployment was a smart thing. Now, that may have been economically necessary. We won't debate that. Uh, it, it is what it is. But here's the problem with that. You are not going to tell me that at the end of eight months, nine months, a year, two years, you're going out there 40 hours a week putting out resumes and keeping job interviews looking for work. There's something very bad and very destructive that happens to the human psyche if you hang around too much. You ba it basically destroys it, it destroys you. It's not healthy. I know from my own personal experience, so when I was in my mid-20s, it was a particularly rough winter in the Northeast, and work was hard to come by because we were too busy surviving with all the great blizzards that came in that year that took two weeks to dig out of and everything else. And I was out of work about two and a half months. And I found myself losing all motivation. I found myself getting up late in the morning and eating breakfast and plopping down on the couch to watch TV and fall asleep and get up at noon and eat lunch and plop down on the couch and watch TV and fall asleep and get up and eat supper and plop down on the couch and watch TV and then go back to bed earlier than I'd ever gone to bed in my life. And it just wasn't good. It moves to depression. It moves to self-doubt, um, despair. It's just not good. And I would recommend to anybody out there, get yourself out into your neighborhood. You know, there's that old widow lady down the street. Her husband died 10 years ago. I'll bet you there's a few things she needs done around her house. You know, knock on her door and tell her her garage door needs to be painted. And if she buys a quart of paint, you'll paint it for her just to get out of the house. Get out of the house, even if just if it's just four hours a day, two days a week, three days a week. It will make a world of difference. If you've got a computer and stuff, you could print up some simple things, uh, four or five to a sheet of paper, and just sit there with a pair of scissors. You don't even need a paper cutter. Just cut them apart and stick them in doors in your neighborhood and just ask around your neighborhood who needs something, you know, who needs their gutters cleaned, who needs uh, some trash hauled to the dump. There's just lots of things you can do. And in fact, later on, um, in a few months, I'm going to be teaching a seminar for the members of the ilovemytools.com crew. And I'm going to pick a number of people out of there. And I'm going to teach step by step. I have been blessed, as I say, because of the trades. And I started four companies, among many, but four specifically, that neither one of them cost more than $100 to start. And all four of them went on to be multi-million dollar companies because of the trades. I'm going to be teaching step by step how you do that because I keep hearing, well, you got to have a million dollars. You got to have this. You got to have money. You got the rich get rich. Well, you know, it may be true the rich get richer, but the poor can get a start too on building their wealth. It's not all that difficult to do. You don't need to wait for loans and all that. You don't need to put a mortgage on grandma's house. There's lots of things you can do to self-fund a business and get it going. And it's a lot of creative strategies. I'm going to be sharing those to uh, a select team of people that I am personally going to mentor who are thinking about doing something for themselves to improve their life. We'll talk more about that after the hour here. There's definite things you can do. Matter of fact, if you look at American business history, some of the largest corporations in this country were started during economic bad times when they were started. You can peg the day they started. You could look to see what the economy was doing. And they were also started with shoestring budgets. Microsoft was started with less than $3,000 cash. Apple, the two gentlemen, uh, Steve Wozniak and, and Steve Jobs, they started that with, uh, they built a couple of computers and to raise the money, they sold their own computers. Basically, they pawned them and got $1,200 out of that, and that's how they built the first dozen or so Apple computers uh, from their own money, basically from what they sold. And none of those folks went to college. You know, they went to, for a couple of years, they dropped out, and none of them were started with multi-million dollar checking accounts. And in fact, the actual statistic is that, uh, according to the Small Business Administration, 
you are, have an 80% greater chance of failing if you start out with a lot of money because you don't get down to business quick enough and you spend too much time not doing your core business. You spend too much time doing things like taking a paycheck out even though there's no money coming in and you spend weeks deciding what color the carpet in the conference room should be or you know what brand of toolbox you should put in the back of your pickup truck or whatever rather than just getting down to the core business, that which generates money. And we'll be talking about that uh, a little bit tonight, but for sure in that mentoring class that I would love to share what I learned, how to finance. It is so easy to finance a business today. It's beyond easy. Once you know a few of the little, whoa, like the light goes on secrets, it, it just becomes really easy to do. It's basically a lie that they tell. And I don't know why they tell that to people. You need money to make money. You need this. You need it. No, you need a good idea and you need a plan and you'll make more money with that uh, than anything else. I uh, once sat in on a lecture back in the early 70s, mid 70s, by a gentleman who was a uh, founder of a company that he founded in 19, late 1940s, mid 1950s. And by the time the 1970s had run, come around, that company was a multi-billion dollar, billion dollar corporation. And he said something that really made a lot of sense to me. And that was that, you know, tonight, all over the world, thousands of ships are going to go out on the ocean. And they're going to have their cargo. And they're going to be going where they're intended to go. They're going to be heading there. And all of them are on the same ocean with the same tide with the same winds, and some of them are going to make it safely to their destination, and others are going to just get wrecked on the rocks. And the only difference was it wasn't the wind. They all had the same wind. It wasn't the tide. They all were sailing the same tide. It wasn't the waves. They all had the same waves. It was the skill of the captain. And if you work on improving you, it's amazing what opens up for you in the trades especially. Because skill in the trades is recognized. Their need to need you is greater than their desire to dislike you or discriminate against you or whatever. If, if you can do the job, the door is open. We do have problems in our society. We're aware of that. But across the board, tradespeople amongst themselves respect each other. And they definitely respect somebody who's a hard worker and who's a skilled hard worker. It's respected in the trades pretty amazing that way that uh that that can happen that way david yeah if i can interrupt you there for a minute uh, you, you brought up the example of the shipping lanes and, and being the captain of your own ship you know that is another mm -hmm. trade if you will that very uh, few people unless you're from the coastal area uh that people mm -hmm. think about if you have somewhere close by you, or if you leave at least uh, within 100 miles of any kind of waterway, uh, look to see if there is a ship building company around, a yacht basin or something to that effect. You will discover mm -hmm. that today, that's one of the few trades that isn't done by mechanics. It's not, uh, um, you know, you don't have to worry about your job being replaced by a machine, in other words. 90% uh, of all ships out there are built from the hull up. And they need every mm -hmm. type of tradesperson you can think of to make a ship. It's yeah. even more in detailed uh, and in depth than building a house. You know, so so yeah. there's a, a, a if you have any type of skill at all, if you can read a measuring tape and swing a hammer, uh, you're not limited just to building a house. You can uh, you know go work into the shipping industry. These jobs are not the kind that are advertised. Uh, those are the type of jobs that, again, you have to be your own captain, be self-motivated. Uh, go back to your uh, original show uh, uh, that we used to do is who's in charge? Be in charge of yourself. Make the effort to go down and say, hey, I'm here. Is there something I can do? The odds are they'll, you'll get hired on the spot. <laughs> they'll always oh, yeah. find something for you to do because uh, shipping industry yeah. is uh, very vast still, and they use – yeah. hundreds and hundreds of workers in these places everything and you're going to learn everything from fine woodworking to especially if you start working in a yacht basin you know i said you got uh hull builders you got uh, plumbing that has to be done you got electrical that has to be done you have uh mechanics for the engines that have to be done there's just so much involved 
uh, and building these ships that uh, it's mind blowing. And it's just uh, it just popped into my head because I <laughs> you get involved in that myself when I was a kid because I was grew up on the, the coastline uh, down here in Florida. And you mentioned the captain. Uh, if it's something you're interested in and you want to get your appraisal ship to start working on a fishing boat or a charter boat local, you don't have to talk about like the big uh, uh, deadliest catch type of ships. Uh, but there's plenty in your area that small charter boats you can go out there and apply for an apprenticeship and go work as a as a uh, you know start out hooking the baits you know putting the bait on the hooks for the the, the tourists that come on they do their fishing and work your way up. Uh, you can get your captain's license. One of the best schools, as a matter of fact, is down here in Florida, is Chapman's. It's uh, one of the most highly recognized uh, schools. It's uh, I think it's a three month program. Uh, you can complete that program, and they do have financial aid available, and it's about ten thousand uh, dollars if you go through the full course, and that will actually to get your captain's license, and you will graduate with, I believe, it's a hundred thousand ton uh, captain's uh, license at that point. Uh, so it is something to think about. The trade, you know, it, it's another trade that when we speak about trades, that gets kind of left out there, but unless you really know about it. So a young person could go to a marina or something. And just ask, say, hey, you know, what do you got that needs to be done around here? And just keep your eyes open and see the opportunities. Believe me, anybody who owns a boat, it's fun to buy a boat. But I'll tell you, after you've owned it a couple of years, a lot of maintenance, cleaning them and keeping them uh, ready to go and everything else. And and believe me, there's lots of weekend work uh, available um, down on the docks, uh, helping boat owners service those boats. The other thing is, that I was going to mention, because everybody keeps talking about jobs going to China and all this stuff we import that's not made here anymore. Well, that's created an opportunity, believe it or not, for more employment. Out in San Diego, so much stuff is coming in, they can't get it off the docks fast enough. And right now, we are short. And I was going to have you talk about this, Dave, because this is in your expertise. We are short right now about 50,000 truck drivers, over-the-road drivers, and it's sad, and we're short for the wrong reason. It isn't that, there are, that the jobs aren't there, and they're decent-paying jobs, but nobody's going to turn over a quarter-million-dollar rig to somebody who can't pee in a cup and pass a drug test, and who doesn't have a high school diploma, at least, who can read and write, do some basic math, read a map or whatever, and would act like they're responsible so they could turn over a million-dollar cargo to them and have an insurance company be willing to underwrite that person. But uh, you had taught tractor trailer skills and driving that. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know there's funding available for that. There's plenty of jobs in that industry. Uh, absolutely. The, the uh, trucking itself, if you have no experience, that's actually better, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, when you're starting out. Zero experience to go to the trade school. The, the schools vary in the prices. Now, I've been out of it now for about 10 years, so uh, I'm not going to quote any prices. But you can call around and, uh, to your local uh, driving schools uh, and get the prices there. They do all have uh, funding available. It's not expensive. It's usually a three-week course. So, you know, here you go. You can be in business and working uh, in a month. And the month is not set by your graduating. It takes 28 days. This is a, a federal regulation from the time you buy your $5 permit, okay, and take the written test, you must have that permit in your possession for 28 days before you can be scheduled for the written, uh, the driven test, the, what they call the basic skills test. Uh, so that's why it's not actually set by the school. Uh, it's actually set by the federal government that you're supposed to have your permit for 28 days. So that's why it takes about three weeks of training. Uh, my breakdown for the classes when I was teaching was one week in the classroom. Don't blow off the classroom. People say, oh, what do you need a week in the classroom for? You'd be surprised how much you need to know and learn. Uh, there's a lot involved in the trucking industry. It's just not, you know, sitting behind a wheel and heading down the road. You know, you got to learn accounting. You got to learn how to take care of your logbook and, and the proper way to fill that out. Uh, plus, of course, most schools during that week, your first three days, they tell you, don't go down and get your permit or take the written test. Uh, what they do is they actually teach you how to take the test in the classroom, <laughs> and that's all part of it. <laughs> so this way, by the time you're done, usually about three, four days into the to your classwork, uh, the next day everybody goes down and takes their written test at their local DMV. 
so they can come back with their permit. The second week you spend on your basic skills. So in other words, you're not going out on the road yet, but you are in a truck and trailer and you learn how to back up a trailer. Straight line backing it's called. You need it for your basic skills test and believe it or not, it's not as easy as it looks to back up a 53 foot trailer. Uh, so these are things that you have to learn how to develop and you'll spend a week in the yard. The third week is when you finally get to go on the road with the instructor and you usually have, uh, we usually take three students with us in the truck and everybody switches off and uh, you know, you practice your upshifting and downshifting and uh, all your rest of your skills involved. And then you got that week off to brush up on anything you may need extra help in before you take your driven test. The beauty thing about it is I'd say about 85%, and I want to say much higher than that, uh, well, actually, you'll have a job before you even graduate. If you got a, especially if you've got a really good school that you go to that's uh, been around a while, a lot of schools actually even own their own trucking company. So when you get done with their class and you graduate from them, they're the ones, the first ones uh, that will offer you a job to go over the road. Uh, so it, there's plenty of opportunity, lots of local work as well. Uh, your average local pay varies, of course, depending on what state you're in. Uh, but you can count on at least even in the uh, cheaper states like mine here in Florida, for example. Uh, pretty much to go drive locally, you know, you're home every night, you, you do your, you, know, you put your hours in, uh, you get 10 bucks an hour. Hell, hell, hey, that's nothing to shake at, especially when you consider all the overtime you can end up with. Uh, a lot of overtime. A trucking job uh, is not 40 hours a week. The average trucker works 60 to 70 hours a week. So when you, and it's not like you're doing a lot of hard physical labor. You, it is a very um, mental job more so than the physical aspect of the job so that you can be home every night uh, you go over the road a lot of companies they want that couple of years experience that's okay you can if you're fresh out of the school like i said you get that opportunity to work for the trucking company that the school may actually own and that'll get you your foot in the door to get that over the road experience you can also do what's known as team driving a lot of uh, newer students will do that they'll get before they send you out solo with a rig, because it is a lot of uh, expense involved here for the company, you know, the price of the rig, the price of your cargo, so on and so forth. Uh, they'll put you out there and you do what they call team driving. And even as a team driver, you're going to make a, de a really decent salary. Uh, after about your first year or two, and I always have told all my students, this is not a job for everybody. There is no middle ground with trucking. You either love it or you hate it, there is no in between because it's a lot of hours, it's a lifestyle you've probably never uh, been introduced to before, it can be a whole heck of a lot of fun, or it could be your worst nightmare. So there, there is no middle ground with trucking, you either love it or hate it and there's no in between. If you love it, you're set for life. Because even in a end world situation, this is why I used to tell my students, the greatest disaster you can possibly think of, man-made, natural, it doesn't matter. But everything is pretty much disappeared and gone. There's four jobs that will always be needed until the last living person is on Earth. A driver, an undertaker, a preacher, and a farmer. So if you don't know one of those skills, guess what? You're set for all eternity until you're the last man standing on planet Earth. And that's men and women, by the way. Women are excellent truck drivers, believe it or not. Uh, so, yeah, women don't count this out as a non-career path because uh, I've trained quite a few women in uh, my time. And, yeah, they, they, they often turn out to be actually better uh, than the guides. But uh, it's a great career. Once you get started, you decide that you love it. I always tell my students, at least one year, go over the road. If you have that opportunity, go. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it's fun. It's exciting. It's an adventure. Every day you're in a different state. You're in a different location. You're you're seeing things. Uh, most companies work with you. If you're not worried about, especially if you're single and you're not worried about being home with the family, you can take those three four days instead of worrying about being home for those days 
and say, hey, you know, hook me up and I want to go to, you know, Disney World. I want to go to Disneyland. Hook me up to go over, you know, to this location, that location, wherever you want to go on the map in the Union. They'll, they'll hook you up to have a run out to that area. When you get there, you drop off your load. Boom. Go hook up. Go take, go do whatever you want for those three, four days. It, it's your time. You have that truck there. You park your trailer. It's, you know, as long as it's locked up, you can leave the trailer. Uh, usually they have a lot uh, somewhere wherever you dropped off uh, at your last location. And you take your, tra- your, your tractor with you. You disconnect and you use that as your personal vehicle. And you go driving, you know, through towns, anywhere, you know, do whatever you want. And it's your time off. And it, it's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, you'll really see a whole nother aspect of the United States that you've never experienced before. I did travel in the trade and work uh, from town to town in the winters, head down south. I absolutely loved it. Every day was a new experience, like you say, and it's not just for truck drivers. It's for people who erect steel buildings and people who do road work and people who do all the different trades. You just never know. And there's some great places around the United States to get some great food and meet some interesting people. But we're going to talk about that after we're going to take a short break right here at the top of the hour. So those of you that need to reheat your cup of coffee and those of you that need to eliminate your cup of coffee, this would be a good time to do that. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. 